A crystal ball won't help you get it. Two crystal balls won't help you get it. Three crystal balls might not even help you get it. I have four more crystal balls and they're still not gonna help you get it. A real dragon egg isn't even gonna help you get it. This guy, he doesn't even, he doesn't even, this real old guy, he's not even gonna help you get it. So what is it? What separates a student from a professional artist? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be discussing five major concepts that professional artists have a deep understanding of and pretty much unlock before they even begin working on any piece of art. These concepts will get you from a student level to a professional level much more quickly than focusing even on your technical abilities like modeling skills, UVing skills. Art isn't entirely technical. It's very philosophical. It's very emotional. It has many intangible concepts that are sort of hard to discuss. My goal with this video is to take those intangible ideas that professional artists understand in a tangible manner and explain them to you. We're gonna be using a scene I created for one of my early CG classes, porting all of the assets over from Maya into Blender without fundamentally changing changing the scene, and by using the exact assets from my student work, I'm going to show how applying these concepts can make your artwork become so much more professional without even increasing your technical ability whatsoever. It's purely fundamental art ideas that we're going to be discussing today. So without further ado, let's talk. Number one, motivation and intent. What does that mean? in the context of your artwork. Whenever you're developing a scene or planning your scene out or deciding what it is you're going to be showing to someone, you need to clarify your motivation for the purpose that this piece of art exists. What is it that motivates someone to look at your artwork? There are so many different things you can assign as motivation that this is a very fluid concept, but some ideas for you could be that you are designing a piece of artwork to show off a character's abilities. You'll see this in a lot of splash art for characters in video games. You see this in games like Overwatch's character splash art, where the character is often in an action pose and it's kind of showing a bit of their personality and who they are. And the motivation in that image is to sell you a piece of information about this character's personality. It could be that you want to show off a place's unique attributes. Maybe you are showing an environment that has a lot of hazards in it and you want to kind of motivate people to be scared of this place or to find and get an idea of what makes this place disturbing and creepy. It could be to help someone understand a specific emotion that maybe you experienced at some point in your life and you want to share with them. It could be a memory that you have of a moment in time, which was something we touched on in my last video where we used the $4,500 Leica lens to render out a blender scene where that scene was capturing a moment in time, a passing moment, a memory, and it was motivated to try and get you to feel and to take in that little bit of time. These ideas are incredibly important because if you don't have a motivated image, oftentimes what happens, especially with beginner artists, the motivation is something like, I want to show off my technical ability. I want to show off the renderer I'm using. I want to show off the software I'm using. I want to show off how real something can look. I want to get hired. All of these ideas are at the forefront of beginners mindsets when they start work because they're simple and they're obvious. But these things are only at the forefront because you don't already have a lock on that. Professional artists aren't thinking of these things because they already know how to utilize them fully. They're way past that. Those are no longer barriers. They're just thinking about the art itself. Fundamentally, what am I motivated to do with this scene? Even going back to Toy Story where, you know, the original Toy Story where it was like the graphics themselves were a major barrier but it didn't stop them from focusing on the story and the intent in each scene. 
And no matter what your limitations are, whether it be your technology or hardware or anything else, you still need to be focusing on the motivation from a compelling place. Number, Number two. two, narrative and history. What is happening here? What has happened here? What might happen here? When a student is asked to create a piece of art, when they're asked to create a scene, they're almost always asked to write a short story about the scene first. And the problem is, is that while it's extremely important to have a narrative around your scene, you need to understand why the narrative exists. Because oftentimes what a student will do is they'll take the narrative or the story for their scene and they will go and they'll pick a bunch of assets that fit into that story. If this is a representation of maybe a childhood memory, they'll take the furniture, they'll find reference for it and they'll find the furniture that was in the room or a specific toy they had or a specific wallpaper they had and they'll get all of these elements from a story and they'll place them into the image and they'll assume that if someone is willing to dig and look into the nuance of the space that they can piece together what this represents. The problem is, is that telling a story in a space is about showing the history of the moment not necessarily just the objects in it. In this example, you'll see how I, in my original piece of art, had a story as a student, and I had a bunch of objects I associated with that story. None of them were utilized in a way that set a scene, gave any kind of history to maybe what the space was used for other than at a generic and high level, and it really led no one to imagine what might happen here in the future. Number three, direction and tone. Direction and tone is interesting because it's, it's sort of ambiguous in nature. I could ask you, what is the vibe of this space? And that doesn't really give you anything tangible to work on. It could be, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a happy feeling, good time right now, and everybody's enjoying the weather. What does that do for me? Nothing. But the mood needs to be specific. I think animated films do this really well in general, and a lot of older Pixar, you know, DreamWorks and Disney stuff do this because they can be so intentional about the environment. And oftentimes when you're looking at a scene or you freeze it, the lighting is set up to sell a specific emotion. The color toning is set up to sell a really specific emotion. Even the camera lenses they simulate are used to set up an emotion. Everything is done in regards to a very specific mood and tone that is very rarely ambiguous. And ambiguity is something that a lot of students struggle with because what we're doing is not necessarily a fine art where ambiguity can have some kind of deep narrative implications to them. What we're doing is showing someone and guiding someone to think, feel, or experience a certain concept. We have to be specific to do that because most people aren't going to take the time to really dig in and go Sherlock Holmes on your scene to pick apart exactly what this feeling, this mood, this space is supposed to represent. So we wanna be kind of obvious about it and really kind of say this space is moody it's happy it's scary it has something specific and the elements we use play into that number four number four is research and reference research and reference is extremely important and professional artists utilize it in everything nothing is left up to chance it's really common especially with 2d artists who are learning to draw, to feel like using reference for drawing is cheating. It's not, I promise you, it's really not. There, there was never a time I did anything at work where I wasn't using exact reference for what I was going for. It's extremely important because it helps the people you're working with understand what you're doing and the intent behind it. It helps you understand and explain to other people 
what the direction of a scene should be. And it helps you make decisions and cut straight through to the result you're looking for without having to do any guesswork. So the better your references, the less guessing you're gonna be doing about what it is you need to do to make your scene successful. If you're trying to show a scene that is set in the 60s, find reference that is purely using furniture from the 60s. It's purely using wallpaper styles that were popular in the 60s. It's purely using the type of color temperature that came from light bulbs that were popularized during the 60s. Find those things and use them to tell the story you want to tell in your image. Number five. Image layout and flow. This one's a hands-on idea. So what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna jump into Photoshop and we're gonna talk about this in the context of my old artwork and my new artwork. Here we are in Photoshop. We've made it to the great nation of Adobe. There are common ideas I'm sure you've heard of in regards to balancing images such as the rule of thirds. So here's a sort of rough applying thirds to this image. And the rule of thirds is helpful in terms of balancing out where things line up. These little crosses are awesome places to put focal points because they end up balancing out well within the images. There's a lot of psychology that goes into the rule of thirds. I'm not going to be discussing it here. There's other ideas like the golden ratio, which is that fantastical little spiral you can utilize to balance your images as well. And then there's some of the other more psychological ideas that play into contrast. You don't necessarily want your contrast to be uniform across the space because your eyes won't know where to look. So in this example, there's a lot of contrast happening here. This is some of the most saturated part of the image. It's also some of the most noisy and high kind of texture area of the image. It's also possibly the brightest area in the image versus this corner, which has very little light, very little texture, very little density, and it's intentionally kept that way because it gives your eyes a place to rest when you look at this image so that you can draw them back to the focal points, which are these paint apothecary jars and this mortar and pestle, which is a kind of secondary actor to the jars. We could talk about saturation, where areas of saturation draw more attention than areas that are desaturated. And so again, that's another thing that happened here where this entire space is very desaturated versus here, where you have a lot of color here, you have a lot of color here, and you have some of the most color in the scene on these actual bottles. And then blank space, another concept where you leave space for your eyes to rest. And so they're not constantly jumping from thing to thing to thing, and they don't know where to look. There's a lot of ways you can actually do that, whether it be using depth of field, it could be using all of the things we talked about previously, and just not putting assets in certain parts of your scene. For this scene, there's really nothing happening here. There's nothing really happening here. There's places where you can really rest your eyes and come back and just focus where I, as an artist, would like you to focus your attention. The last thing that is extremely important is flow. And flow plays into a lot of the prior concepts as well as leading lines. So leading lines, for example, is taking sometimes the literal orientation of something in your scene, like this floorboard or even the energy that something is kind of pointing to so for this it kind of swoops down this way or for this it could be that the label is looking this way and so this creates a leading line of sorts it could be the slope here or this thing here those are like the literal versions of leading lines there are the more psychological leading lines that i like to utilize a lot which could be that there's nothing happening here and your eyes typically focus on points of interest and so there's a leading line from this space that realistically points you back out of it or you know you can use this wall divider to kind of do a similar thing or here where you look at nothing and it points you to this little highlight here and this highlight follows this board down follows this down to here and here 
So you kind of get this energy that points in these directions based off using you know, saturation, contrast, value, blank space, giving your eyes a rest, all of these ideas. This amounts to something really important and that we want to create a flow of energy in our images that allows the viewer to kind of cycle through the picture without ever leaving the page, without losing interest in the image. In this case, some of the major leading lines I've thought of are I'm pointing the user out from here. This is important to me because I don't want someone to focus on that corner. I have this little spout which feels like it's pointing into the image. You have the cork of this apothecary bottle that is pointed out this way. You have the label that sort of points sort of like this. You have this label which points sort of like this. You have this energy that points back down, something like this. You have this energy that points this way for me. You have the light coming off of this, which sort of bounces between these two objects because the source of the light is up in the top right of this image. So it points you here. And then your eyes like to look at where something is coming from sometimes, which is really subtle, but it could be interesting. So then you have a bit of energy going this way. You have this point on the floor, which is a nice resting basin of neutral energy that can go either way. And then it goes back up to here. And then this sort of takes this beam, flows this way and goes back into here. So what you get when you kind of sum up a bunch of those energy sources is a flow that looks like this. And that is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> the result is that you sort of float around in a counterclockwise direction or clockwise, I guess, if you were to go the other way as well, I feel like the energy mostly flows this way. And so this image does an awesome job of keeping you invested in the space. Let's do the same thing here. The contrast of the image is basically the same throughout this entire area. Nothing's really specifically brighter, nothing's darker. There's not any difference in noise. There's nowhere to really rest your eyes. We don't have a lot of blank space and there's no focus. Coming up here, we have this one area of brightness, which ends up being the entire focus of the image because it's the only thing that has any kind of contrast or separation from everything else happening in the scene. Now, this is a problem because it plays into a lot of the prior concepts we talked about, like motivation and intent. Is there a clear motivation for someone to look at this image? Is there a clear motivation that I, as an artist, wanted to sell to someone if they should experience this image? And looking at it now, I couldn't tell you because the focus is this green jug, which tells me nothing other than maybe it was filled with moonshine and the artist was an alcoholic. I don't know. There's really nothing this sells me on. Was the artist possibly making these dyes? I don't know, because the mortar and pestle is so hidden and pushed away into the background that it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Is the artist actively painting in this workshop? I don't know, again, because their palette is pushed up against the wall with the other palettes in a way that makes it look like in storage. What are these doing here? Were they for still lifes? It's not clear. So we can go through and basically rip apart why motivation and intent were not obvious within this picture. Narrative in history. I can gather some history of the place through the texture work in that it's old, it's dilapidated, but that's it. I don't know what's currently happening here in terms of narrative. I don't know what just happened here in terms of narrative. And I have no idea what's going to happen here in terms of narrative. All of those things are completely missing from this image. Direction and tone. Again, another thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What is the direction or tone of this image? It looks like it's possibly midday. We have some light coming in through an unidentified light source, maybe a skylight, but it doesn't give me an idea of what the mood is here. Is it sad? No, not really. It's kind of a bright, sunny day. It doesn't even look like there's a cloud in the sky. <laughs> is it a memory? There's nothing that indicates it's a memory. Is it exciting? Is it foretelling? Is it 
Fortunus, all of those things are missing. We're missing direction and tone entirely. Research and reference, while you can't see it here, there was plenty of research and reference. Pretty much everything in the scene was based off something, but I wanted to use apothecary jars to store the paints or dyes. And the thing is, people don't really do that. Apothecary jars weren't really used to store dyes or paint. They were used for other things. And so it's not entirely clear because of that one choice what is happening and what those things are in the scene. And as a student, I thought to myself, it doesn't matter. Someone can look at this and they'll take the time to figure it out. No one's going to do that. And the image layout and flow, we have this bottle. It has a directional line that goes up towards this little red splotch, which almost feels like blood, even though it's paint, and it goes down. And so when you look at this bottle, you go up or down. You Maybe you go up and you look up to where this light source is and then you're off the page. So the only thing that happens with the image layout and flow is that it shoots you off of the image immediately, right away, there's nothing. We look at the chair, boom, maybe you get a little bit of attention going here, but then there's nothing to look at. Get a little bit of attention going here, you get a little bit of attention going here, you have some light that draws you here possibly to this thing and then it draws you maybe down here and maybe to this crack and so if you really wanted to stretch it you can create a loop here just like the previous image but it's very weak it's very chaotic there's a lot of disturbance in it in that nothing here is pointing to anything specific other than maybe this this is sort of pointing out this way but you don't know what this object is here for, and so you get confused on that. The rule of thirds, we have the apothecary jar on the rule of thirds, but it's hidden and it's blown out. Maybe we have this piece of glass here. We have this bottle on the rule of thirds, but the bottle's label isn't facing us, so I'm not really sure if we're supposed to be looking at it. This palette is not really on the rule of thirds, and so nothing is really giving us an indicator of what we should be focusing on when we look at this image. So, in comparison, when we have these images side by side and we look at my new piece of artwork compared to my old piece of artwork, in the new piece of artwork, the motivation and intent is more clear, even though I'm using the same assets. It's not perfect though, because the scene wasn't designed with the motivation and intent in mind from the initial conception. And that's an issue that becomes exceedingly hard to correct as you get further and further into a project. The real motivation and intent was that I needed a portfolio piece and I wanted to get a job. There wasn't really much going into it other than I need to show off my texturing work, I need to show off my lighting work, and I need to show off some of these other things. And it's like, unfortunately, those things get lost in the fact that the image itself isn't as strong as it should be. So putting these two images side by side, my student work on the left, my new piece of artwork on the right. I used the same assets. I didn't change the textures except for on the little glass vase in the back where I darkened the glass because I wasn't a huge fan of the or perfectly clear glass. I repositioned things in the scene. I changed the lighting to imply that the space is maybe being used currently for a still life. We have the shadow of a statue or a woman falling on the wall, which if you've been in an art studio is pretty common when a still life is in progress. The space is in use. The motivation and intent are partly to show you all how you can improve your scene. So there's a little bit of missing intent in that I'm doing this for YouTube. But the other side of the intent is to show a artist's workspace in action and to give you a little insight into maybe who this person might be. There's a bit more information on the narrative and history and what's currently happening here, what has happened here, and what will likely happen here in the future. The direction and tone is more specific. It's not entirely specific as to whether this should represent something like happiness, sadness, or even a memory. The mood is one that's a little bit more somber and warm and maybe a feeling of going into one of your grandparents or parents' art studio or that feeling of sort of a, a warm memory. And so, well, this is left up to interpretation and you're free to interpret it however you want. That's sort of what I was going for. The reference and research were exactly the same ones I used from the original scene. 
so I just kept that. The flow of the image is a lot more intentional in that we have a focal point, we have our main actors, we have our sub actors, our supporting actors, and we have everything in the image placed and set out in a way that makes sense narratively, historically, and it feels like something a lot more organic and natural. And while a lot of these ideas are inherently fluid and subjective, it is absolutely worth taking the time to think about them and consider them if you want to see your artwork go from a beginner level to a professional level much more quickly than someone who is just focused purely on the technical elements that have to do with artwork. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope this video was more helpful than even seven crystal balls could be and that you enjoyed it, even though it's a little bit more conversational and less of a tutorial video. Let me know what you think. And if you like this type of content, I really enjoy making it and talking about these sort of subjective ideas because I feel like they're a bit underrepresented, at least on YouTube in terms of the artist communities. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to stick around. I'll be doing a lot more content like this and more specific tutorial stuff and just random creative ideas that have to do with digital and maybe even some traditional art in the future. Really appreciate you. Thank you for sharing your time with me. I'm glad to give the rest of it back to you and I hope you have a wonderful day. Peace out.